Yesterday we discussed about two things. Yeah. The material ego and the spiritual ego. Right. So most people, they try to become free from the material ego just by giving it up. But you cannot. It's very sticky. <laughs> you try to get rid of it, but it sticks to you. You can only really become free from the material ego by accepting a spiritual ego. And that is the I am Krishna Das, the servant of Krishna. So as soon as someone becomes fixed in that Abhiman, that self-identity, Oh Krishna, I am your servant. Then you don't consider your own happiness anymore. How can I please Krishna? You see, the reason we feel unhappy is because we're thinking about our own happiness. And the situation in the world is never perfect. You try to make a perfect situation, but it never happens. So that's the cause of all anxiety. So stop thinking about your own happiness and think, how can I please Krishna? How can I please my Guru? Hmm? At least Guru is related to Krishna. To, please, to serve the Guru who is related to Krishna is also pleasing to Krishna. And then automatically, you see, all your anxiety goes away. Completely. There's no other way. There's no way to make, you cannot make a mental adjustment. You cannot throw off the ego. It will stick to you. You move this way and another problem comes. You move that way and another problem comes. It's, there's no way out. But when we accept the spiritual ego, Krishna, I am your servant. Then you'll see and surrender. Atma nivedana tuya pade kori hoinu parama sukhi dukkha dure kelo chintana rohilo chauri ke anando dekhi One saint he said, O oh Krishna, from the very moment I just gave my heart to you, I am feeling supremely blissful. All of my anxieties have gone far away. And any direction I look, I see only joy. Surrender. Were you in the class this morning? Ah, this is also the I was <laughs> From my ten, I was listening to chants. Uh -huh. yeah. You must come in the class. Yeah, yeah. Because when I'm speaking, I'm putting chitta vrittis. Yeah. Now you have chitta vrittis, but they're disturbed. And when I'm speaking through the vibration, I'm overriding your material chitta vrittis with material chitta vritti. Like that. And you feel like you had a very big injection of vitamins yeah. after just one class. <laughs> and it's better if I try to kill myself with spiritual energy. No? Uh -huh. It's not depend on anybody. Um, no, you have to depend in the beginning. It's like... It's like a baby when... Yes, mother. if there's a small plant and there's no rain, then the plant will dry. So someone has to give some water every day and it will grow. But when it becomes a big tree, when there's no rain, all the small plants die, but the tree is still green because the roots have gone very deep and it's taking water from the ground. So in the beginning of Bhakti Yoga, you have to come to the Guru and receive the water, the spiritual mercy, and become strong. And afterwards, when you become very spiritually strong, even if you're not associating, but from inside, from the, your deep roots in Bhakti, you'll be nourished internally. But in the beginning, no one can survive. That's why all the scriptures, all the scriptures give the same conclusion. Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Shastrikoi, Lava Matra, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Siddhyan. All the books say, stop reading the book and go to a sadhu. <laughs> and the Sangha is important also. Yes, Sadhu Sangha. Sadhu means in Sanskrit. <clears throat> there are three things. Sadhya, Sadhya means your goal. And what you do to attain your goal is called sadhana. So sadhana is what you do to attain sadhya. And the person who teaches you how to attain your sadhya, your goal, by doing sadhana is a sadhu. So sadhnoti sadhayati iti sadhu. The person who himself is doing sadhana and who adjusts and refines your life so you are also doing sadhana is called a sadhu. And when we come and have our life very finely tuned, our sadhana very finely tuned, then that is called Sangha. The word Sangha in Sanskrit comes from two parts. Some, 
means samya krupena completely and ga means anugaman to go behind to follow so sangha means to completely follow the sadhu outwardly and also internally so when we completely follow outwardly and internally then it can be called sadhu sangha every sanskrit word has a very profound etymology so it's important to learn this then you have a very clear and scientific conception of spiritual life spiritual life is not vague and like smoke and phantoms spiritual life is a very precise science actually but we must hear the explanation of vedas so then it will become clear in our in our mind and we can walk with confidence not confidence in our strength but confidence in the past thank you any question raise your hand if you have a question so i'm seeing one here one here any other with question one there yes okay so we'll come to them one by one yes your question yes uh, i i was uh, sur was surprised that you went to the uk parliament uh -huh. as i know you are from england i just like to know if you have any opinion about that movement that has been recently you know in in england the extinction rebellion that what extin rebellion? extinction rebellion extinction rebellion that to stop all the city and for the climate for the oh, climate, for climate control climate control climate Oh, yeah, climate change to stop the climate change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because in England has been very, very strong movement. No? Yes, yes, yes. And I don't know if there is any link between Hare Krishna and help for from that, like in the 60s or 70s, mm -hmm. you know, in the streets. And... Yes, yes. The transcendentalists, they never become involved in politics. I did not go to the parliament to pass any laws. <laughs> I went there only to tell them that if you don't try to develop your love for God, then you are wasting your life. And when the end of your life comes, then all of your worldly activities, they will mean nothing at all. And you'll be full of fear. So try to develop love for God. And you can make policies which also are favorable for the people. For example, now the media is promoting immorality and sinfulness it is glorifying oh taking drugs is very good having sex with everyone is very good mm, violence is oh don't do it but you can watch it <laughs> if you watch it you will do it huh? so the media uh, this is all these things are everywhere so there's no there's no possibility for censorship so i told the very wealthy people there who own banks i said you invest in a media which is wholesome which can uplift the people which has a good message for the character of the people so these things i spoke about uh, but otherwise i don't become involved in political things uh, on the other hand the concern about the climate is a very it is sattvic it is a sattvic idea so sattva gun though sattva is not transcendental but it's not unfavorable for bhakti so when you should do bhakti but live in the sattvic atmosphere so we consider that earth is a person mother earth so just as we don't make offense to anyone we we should not make offense to mother earth we should not make pollution so but i consider that it's down to each nation each nation should make the laws to stop the pollution because this climate change business is about making international laws taking the sovereignty away from the individual countries and putting it in the power of one um, transnational uh, organization <laughs> an unelected transnational organization and when they have power over your emissions but they'll also have power over other things that you did not ask for so on the one hand yes try to protect the planet don't pollute anything on the other hand campaigning to make a uh, international law on top of the local sovereignty is actually taking away the freedom political freedom from all the people to actually impose tyranny so don't think that the persons at the top of this movement of the climate change 
are concerned about the climate. They don't care. They're trying to slip in a tyranny, a control over everyone through in disguise of a, your concern for the climate. Thank you. Maybe not the people Thank of this. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so everything should be everything should be local. Local. Each group of person in each place they should locally take responsibility. Don't hand over your responsibility to someone somewhere else in the world to have control over you. This is never accepted. Invaders to society is that they are small kingdoms. You see, India was not a country. India was never a country. It was Orissa, Bengal, Punjab, Gujarat, Bihar. It was many, many small kingdoms. And there was a king in each place. Only after uh, the British left and, and they became independent, then it was put together as a big nation. But that is actually not a Vedic idea. Vedic idea is personal. Deal with people face to face and don't take more than you can <laughs> control. Let someone else control something else like this. So, yeah. Is it okay? Yeah, yes. Yeah, the sense, like you say, in that movement, it's just uh, people want to create assemblies of democracy, not, not in the top. No? In yes. The, the world, thing is uh, that yeah, yeah. persons who are very cunning are you, uh, trying to use your good nature to take advantage of you. You know, there's a way to emo emotionally manip manipulate someone. They have a good side, but you can use the good side against them. And this is what is happening. Yeah. So, you, you say there is a, a good activism based on spiritual love for God, love mm -hmm. for the spiritual uh, being. Yes, what you uh, can... Yes. Active in the, in the concrete uh, world around you. Yes, yes. But you should have your priorities. There's a pyramid of priorities. And the top of the pyramid is Krishna. <laughs> love is the main thing. Actually, Krishna himself in Kali Yuga appeared in a golden avatar called Chaitanya. And actually, we have a book of his biography translated into Spanish. If someone, can you bring from the table? It is a 500 years old biography of the avatar of Krishna, the golden avatar, Chaitanya. And we have in Spanish now, just printed recently. It's very wonderful. So I want to tell one history from here. So, here it is, the golden avatar. 500 years ago, in Bengal, that area of India had been conquered, like many areas of India, by Muslims. And so there was a Muslim emperor named uh, Nawab Hussein Shah, and he ruled that place. And his local magistrates in Navadweep, where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was, his name was the Chan Kazi. So, they were very political persons and they were controlling the Hindus. And when they saw devotees with Murdanga and doing Kirtan, they didn't see it that it was a religious movement. They thought that it was uprising of Hindu nationalism. So some soldiers came and when the devotees were playing Kirtan, they smashed the drums. So the, and they made a law, no Kirtan, no Kirtan anywhere. So those devotees came to Sri Chaitanya and they said to the soldiers have come, they broke our drums, they passed a law that there can be no kirtan anywhere. So then Sri Chaitanya, he said, tell everyone, tomorrow evening, you should come with torches, fire, you know, lit torches, and with many, many madangas, and we'll make a big kirtan through the street. And it was like a civil disobedience, like Mahatma Gandhi did many years later, but Chaitanya was the first person to make a peaceful civil disobedience movement in India. But when they marched, they did not march only with the flag, whatever, with their slogan. Their slogan was, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And thousands and hundreds of thousands of people went through the streets, all singing, and with flaming torches. And they surrounded the palace of the Chankazi. And then he and his soldiers, also they became afraid because they thought they may throw the torches and then set everything on fire. <laughs> so he came out and there was a beautiful discussion between Chaitanya and the Chankazi. And the Chaitanya by his mercy, he gave mercy to the Chankazi. The Chankazi said to him, actually, Chaitanya, can I call you Gorahari? <laughs> Gora means golden. And Hari means like a lion. He would dance like a lion in the kirtan. He said, can I call you Gora Hari? He said, yes, of course. 
said, last night I had a dream. What did you see? In my dream, I saw a person with the body of a human being, but the head of a lion. And they jumped on my chest and they were about, he was about to tear me apart. But then he stopped and said, mm, you have not done, a, you have not made a big problem. But if you don't let the kirtan go on, I'll come again and next time I'll kill you for sure. <laughs> and then he disappeared. And then when the Kazi woke up from the dream, he looked and he had scratches on his chest. So he knew this was not a dream. It was something supernatural. So he, then he gave permission. I promise that as long as I live, and my son and my grandson and my great-grandson, as long as my family are in this world, that you can do kirtan all over Navadu. So even today, 500 years later, uh, the kirtan is going on there in, in Navadu. Hmm? So this is example how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his focus was Krishna. But at the same time, he interacted with the political leader for the sake of making society a safe place for bhakti. Hmm? The, now people are... The, the soldiers go here and there in the world, whatever, fighting to make the world safe for democracy or whatever it is. Huh? So we are interested in how to make the world peaceful so that everyone can practice bhakti peace. A pure devotee can practice bhakti even in the middle of war. They have no problems. But the common people cannot. So for their benefit, it's, peace is good. So this is why I was invited to the parliament to speak about the, the role of spirituality in the peace of society. And, and what was the response from the politician? What's the energy of them? It was, it was mainly very positive. I sp were you in my lecture yesterday morning? Yeah, I spoke about the head of the World Bank came to me. Yeah, yeah, I remember. And he just opened his heart. And actually, the next day, my mother came to visit me. He's the head now or the previous head? He was the previous. Yeah. So he, he, when my mother came, he saw my mother and he said, Your son is taking us all to paradise. <laughs> and my mother started to cry. <laughs> <laughs> so, there was a very positive reaction from it, but everyone will not react positively. And this is a very deep point. And this is something that people today don't want to acknowledge. If you look at chapter 16 of Bhagavad Gita, chapter 16, that chapter is called um, Daiva Asura Sampad Yoga the yoga of understanding two natures the nature of the angelic nature of the demigods and the demonic nature of the demons so in this world according to persons past karmas some are naturally inclined to spirituality and some are demons they are literally like demons in a human form they are psychopaths they have no conscience whatsoever, but they behave like they're very friendly. But they want to kill you. Huh? And you cannot, you are a good person. You cannot imagine how their minds work, how evil they are. So don't think, we don't actually believe in equality. We don't believe in equality. There's no equality anywhere in the world. Huh? Show me two people who are the same. I can't see, everyone looks different to me. Everyone has a different height, different weight. Everyone has different IQ, different intelligence, different past experience. Everything is different. You can have equality of opportunity. Equality of opportunity. We want for everyone. But you cannot have equality of outcome. Because some people work hard and some people are lazy. Some people are honest and some people are criminal. You want the criminal to have the equality of outcome with the honest person. Hmm? Let's give a medal to the criminal. Release, release from the prison and give him, make him the, the, the president. Actually, it usually happens. <laughs> so, the thing is, but it's not only a question of in nature, there are hierarchies in nature. There are cycles in nature. Yeah? There's the water cycle, you know? The, the water from the ocean evaporates and becomes the clouds. The clouds go and hit the mountain and then they rain and then the rain comes down in the rivers and then the rivers go back to the ocean the water cycle is gone there's a rock cycle also 
Huh? There's a molten rock in the middle of the earth. And it comes up through the volcanoes and spreads out. And then it goes down in layers and another layer, another I layer. And it goes it. back to the middle. It's not true. And so there's a... Okay. There's a, some evidence that there's a rock cycle. So, the thing is that there are hierarchies in nature. There are not hierarchies in nature? Yes, but... Okay, so this is the point. Just stay on that point. So, there are hierarchies everywhere. And in humility, we have to see where we are, where we connect. In, in those hierarchies. Hmm? Layers. 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 There are layers. There are layers in nature. So, there are also layers in society. And it will always be like that. No one can change it. But in addition to that, chapter 16 of Bhagavad Gita describes that some persons by their past life sanskar are naturally inclined towards goodness and some persons they are they get pleasure from the suffering of others you have to know this for you it's unimaginable but there are persons who literally feel great when they torture and and give other suffering and they really exist in this world and this is why uh, in the Vedic society, the society is divided into sections. You have the Brahmanas, who are the intellectuals and the priests. Then you have the Kshatriyas, they are warriors. The Sikhs are warriors. They were actually Hindus, who became an army to protect the other Hindus from the Muslims. You see? So there has to be a caste of warriors. Mm? So those means there are some certain men in society, they are very high testosterone. Mm? So they have to be organized to fight. The geeks and the the computer geeks say they cannot fight. <laughs> eh? They have to do the inventions. They have to work on it. So those who have the low testosterone and high IQ, they have to do the inventing, the intellectuals. And those who are high testosterone, they have to do the fighting. Hmm? Then there are others who they like the land. They are the farmers. They have to grow the food. If someone doesn't grow the food, you will starve. Like this. And then there are the, the sudras. They are the artisans. That means laborers artists that actually in Bedisai also includes doctors, musicians, sports persons. They're, so there's a um, that is called the social body. The Brahmanas are the head of the social body. The Kshatriyas are the arms of the social body for protection. The farmers are the stomach of the social body. They feed everyone. And then the artisans are the legs that carry society along. So one of the politicians I was just saying in the part, he says there are two types of people. Those who think that they run society and those who keep society running. Mm -hmm. It's a big difference. <laughs> so the legs keep <laughs> the artisans and the laborers, they keep the, everything running. They're also very important. So each person, according to their past life's karma, they have a nature. So everyone can be involved in their duties in society according to their nature, but they do it not for themselves and even not for each other but for God. And in this way, you have a very beautiful, uh, well-organized society, but everyone's mind is aiming beyond this world. So you're in the world, but aiming beyond the world. And so this is described in uh, chapter 3 and chapter 4 of Bhagavad Gita, Karma Yoga. There it is said, hmm, that Chatur Varnam Maya Sistam Guna Karma Vibhagasha. Krishna said, I had created all human beings in such a way that they have four different natures. And these four natures collaborate together for the perfect harmony in society. So that's the political element of Krishna consciousness from Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> Once I was in an airport with my Guru Dev. I flew around the world 24 times with my Guru. We would fly about 60 times every year. So I have spent literally years of my life in airports with my spiritual teacher. <laughs> so it was very nice because it's like this. You sit in the airport waiting for your flight and you can have spiritual discussion. <laughs> so one time he said, a man came once to the airport and he sat down in the seat. And then he saw, oh, the seat was loose. So he looked underneath and noticed that the bolts were loose. So he was a mechanic and in his hand luggage he had some tools. So he opened his bag and took out his spanner and got underneath the seat and he was fixing it. <laughs> so he, he fixed it and now it was tight, it was good. And then he looked and he saw that his plane was taking off. <laughs> 
<laughs> so the teaching is this <laughs> that you have you have been born to become self-realized God has given you a human body so that you can become perfect in spiritual life but in the meantime if you become distracted looking at the world and thinking I have to fix everything actually you will not be successful as that person because you will not be able to fix everything <laughs> You fix one thing, someone else is broken. <laughs> and in the meantime, your life has passed. And you'll see, your soul will have to go. Huh? But you have missed the main duty of life. So, we are not against the some attention given to the organization of society in a way which is peaceful for the people. But you have to have your pyramid of priorities and make Krishna, your love for God, the top. And then the others, they all fit into that naturally. Naturally they'll fit into place. Thank you. It was a very deep and important question that's important to all of us. And what's your name, sir? Daniel. 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 <laughs> Can I call you Dan? Dan. Dan. Yes. <laughs> because Dan is a Sanskrit name. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, I think it, it means innocence, maybe? Dan, no. uh, Dan means charity. Charity. Okay. Dan, it comes from Dadati. Dadati in Sanskrit means he gives. So you are Dan. You are very charitable and very giving person. <laughs> That's your name in Sanskrit, Dan. Cuando no estamos contigo, cuando no estamos contigo, leemos las escrituras como el Bhagavad Gita, el Sriman Bhagavatam, el Avatar Dorado, nos conecta también. Cuando estamos sin tu, sin tu presencia, leer esos libros nos conecta también con Dios. If you are not, um, if we are not with you, but then we read the scriptures. Mm. So this will also connect us with God? Yes, absolutely. The, okay, here is a, a scripture of Vedic knowledge. The ancient ones, such as the four Vedas, Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Atava Veda, Yajo Veda, the Upanishads, Ishupanishad, Katupanishad, Mundakupanishad, Vedanta Sutra, the Puranas, like Padma Purana, and Bhagavad, Bhagavad Purana is the best of all the Vedic scriptures. The best, if you only read one v book of the Vedas, Bhagavad Purana is the one. Bhagavad Purana, the best. And then you have, of course, the Mahabharata is very famous. Mahabharata. And the Ramayana, also. These are beautiful. So, <clears throat> the, the Vedas are called Sruti. Sruti means that which you hear, because you actually cannot understand them by reading them. If you just read, you become confused. So there's a process. The first stage is Sruti, you listen to your Guru. And then what you've heard, you go back and you look it up. And then you read it to fix what you heard. Mm. And then after that, you have to meditate on it. And then after that, you realize it. So it is said in the Bhagavad Purana, Tat Srinvan Supatan Vicharana Tato Bhaktya Vimuchyanara. First listen, then study, then meditate, then realize. A, a very big problem comes in this modern day that independently persons they just download some Vedic scripture from internet and teach themselves and then start to teach someone else and it just makes chaos so the Vedas themselves say for example in um, in the second verse of uh, chapter 4 of Bhagavad Gita 4.2 it is said evam param para praptam imam raja shovidu Sakalanaha Mahata Yoga Nashta Parantapa. Krishna said, In ancient times, hmm, I spoke this teaching of yoga, bhakti yoga, to Surya, the sun god. And he taught it to uh, his son, Ikshvaku. No, sorry, Manu. And he taught to Ikshvaku. And in this way, the transcendental knowledge was passed guru to disciple, guru to disciple. But Krishna said, after many thousands of years, this chain was broken. And because the chain was broken, the knowledge disappeared. 
y por eso el conocimiento se so the books are still there los libros están ahí but the knowledge is gone why? because you cannot have access to the true meaning of the books uh, by reading it comes by receiving the sound vibration from guru to disciple so Krishna said hey Arjun today I'm speaking this Bhagavad Gita again to you to start the chain again also in the Padma Puran it said Sampradaya vihinaye mantraste nishvala mataha atakalau bhavishyanti chakture sampradayinaha. Which means that if you receive a mantra, but it's not in a sampradaya, that means a chain of gurus going back to God, then this mantra will not give the fruit, it will not give the full effect. So atakalau bhavishyanti means in the future. This was 5,000 years ago. So in the future, this Kali Yuga, it said there are four sampradayas, four lines. One from Brahma, one from Lakshmi Devi, the goddess of fortune, one from Shiva, and one from the four Kumaras, the four sages, brothers. So when you receive a mantra, you should uh, ask the Guru, what is your parampara? This is why on the stage next to me also, always we keep the picture with all the gurus going back 5,000 years to Krishna. So our line is coming from Krishna to Brahma. So it's called the Brahma Madhva Gaudiya Sampradaya. So you can have a very strong faith that the mantras that we are giving have the, they are potent, spiritual power. Otherwise, if you go in any line, anywhere, you cannot guarantee that the mantra will have power. There are two things. One is called a Sampradaya and one is called a Panta. A Sampradaya is a line of gurus that starts with God himself and the panta means uh, one day there was some charismatic person they themselves have no guru they just had some inspiration and they began to teach their students and they taught students so a line comes but it started with a charismatic person it did not start from the beginning of the universe from God himself so that is called a panta so if a mantra comes in pantra you can get some material benefit but you cannot get liber become liberated and attain transcendental benefits so it's very important to understand the difference between panta like just a, some tradition which appeared historically and a parampara a sampradaya which is the, the the vehicle of Sanatan Dharma. Sanatan Dharma means eternal religion. The word Dharma in Sanskrit is religion, but it doesn't mean religion like a set of doctrines. The word Dharma comes from the verbal root uh, Dri. Dri Datu in Sanskrit means to hold. So Dharma means a quality, a property that something holds that he can never let go. So, for example, there's no such thing as Christian sugar, Buddhist sugar, Hindu sugar. Sugar is sugar. So, if the sugar is not Christian or Hindu or Buddhist or Jewish, what, what's the religion of the sugar? The Dharma of sugar is to be sweet. It may be brown sugar, white sugar, cubes, powder, and, but if it's not sweet, it's not sugar. So the dharma of sugar is to be sweet. The dharma of fire is to give heat and light. So the question comes, what is the dharma of my soul? The dharma of the soul is service. You see? Everyone is serving. Mother is serving the child. The husband is serving his wife. Someone is serving his boss at work. Everyone is paying tax and serving the government. Someone is serving. If you have no one to serve, then what do you do? Then you buy a cat. Like, you can, it's only, we cannot stop it. We just want to stop. We always want to serve someone. So this is service is the dharma of the soul. But the question comes, if our nature is service, what is the object of our service? Because our soul is eternal. So an eternal soul cannot have a temporary object of service. So Krishna, that means the word, the syllable Krish means existence. So when I say Krishna, don't think I'm referring to some sectarian Hindu god. Krish means the totality of all existence, including everything and leaving out nothing. 
Krishna is that is Krishna. That and uh, na means nevriti, ananda, joy. So Krishna means the totality of reality, whose internal nature is to be completely joyful. So if you're not seeing the joy everywhere, then you're not seeing the reality of existence. That is Maya illusion. So Krishna is the totality of existence whose nature is joyful. But that uh, supreme reality, don't think reality is just some force. Hmm? Reality has personality. If you can have a personality, then why cannot the Supreme Truth have a personality? Are you more than the Supreme Truth? No. So Supreme Truth also must have a personality. <laughs> and so Bhakti Yoga is how to come out of illusion and connect with the personality of reality. Yes. Even the name Christ, 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 it's coming from the vibration of Christ, Krishna. And that is why the Christians, they also have a rosary. And they have a Jesus prayer. Oh, you may know there was a monk named uh, Hilarion in the Caucasus. And he was staying there for many years and just chant. He was chanting the Jesus prayer. Oh, my Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That was his mantra. He was saying it again and again. So gradually, as he was doing this for many years, he dropped a part of the... He said, have mercy on me, a sinner. He dropped that. And then the part, oh, my Lord, he dropped that. Son of God, he dropped that. And in the end, he was just saying... Krista, 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 Krista. <laughs> and he saw God. And then he wrote a book. And in this book he gave a philosophy, and it's the same as our philosophy. There's a technical name for our philosophy. It's called onomatodoxy. Onomatodoxy is the uh, philosophical term. Hmm? That means the, the, the doctrine that God and his name are exactly the same. There's no difference between God and his name. So even in Christianity, that monk, he discovered this truth. But in the Vedas, thousands of years ago, it was said, Nama chintamani krishnas chaitanya rasa vigraha puna shuddho nityamukto abhinatvam nama namino. <coughs> the name of Krishna is a jewel, the most valuable jewel which fulfills all desires. The name of Krishna is fully conscious and full of rasa, all the flavors of love. The name of Krishna is complete, liberated, perfect. Why? Abhinatvam nama namino. Because there's no difference between the name and the named. So in this world, if you say water, 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 you will still be thirsty. <laughs> because there's a difference between the signifier the word which is a signifier and that which is signified, the water. But the transcendental world is beyond duality. There's no duality there. So the name of Krishna and Krishna himself are the same. <coughs> exactly the same. But we don't believe it. And this is why it's necessary to take shelter of a Guru. And by surrendering to Guru and serving Guru, we become infused with the Sraddha. Very strong conviction in the power of the name. And then when we do our daily sadhana, meditating, slowly, slowly, the chitta becomes clean. The inner conscious, the subconscious mind becomes cleansed of all past life impressions and becomes shining like a mirror. And in the shining mirror of the heart, there you can see the reflection of your own soul's form and the reflection of the smiling face of Krishna. Oh, now you have, your life has become perfect. And it's for sure, at the end of this life, you'll be absorbed in Krishna. And whatever you think of in the last moment, you'll go there. If you're the man I'm telling, in the last moment of your life, if you think of a woman, the next life you'll become a woman. If a woman thinks of a man in the next life, in the, at the end of life, next life she'll become a man. If you remember your cat at the last moment of your life, then you'll be a cat. And if you remember Krishna in the last moment, then you will 
go to Krishna, have a spiritual form like His and serve Him eternally in the spiritual world. That is graduation day. Okay? Don't be worried about dying, it's nothing. Dying is only like graduation ceremony. For those who studied when they were alive. Eh? If you don't study, then you fail, you have to come back and do the course again. <laughs> Before you said we have to be really confident in our, in our path, but and you said like when we, we are with you and you are talking, we are drinking like all your mercy. But I know now, like I was too much questioning after Vrindavan, and now I always go home and say I will be again so so lost. Even if I listen your classes and I'm reading and I'm chanting, yes. but my mind is so like uh, always analyzing everything and then the pastime and stuff and being like yeah so, so you have to associate as much as you can yeah. <laughs> either with me or any other devotees who have advancement it will give you strength but i'm telling you just like you were with us in vrindavan yes. then you went back to france yes. and then you began to have so many doubts like this but something inside you was there that yeah. brings you back so next time you go back again it will happen but it will not be so bad it will be less and each time it will become less and less, and then after some time, why? Because all your thoughts are coming from samskar. Samskar means the impressions of your activities in your subconscious mind. And they, those impressions come into the conscious mind in the form of vasanas, thoughts and desires. So you have many, many material samskars. So when you come in association of Guru, then Guru gives a spiritual samskar. Yeah. And you feel so nice. Then when you go away, your mature sanskars come out again. And slowly they cover the spiritual sanskars. Mm. Like this. And they, they're shining just a little bit. Shining is there, not completely covered. So then gradually, as you associate more and more, especially if you do parikrama, visiting the holy places with us, lots of kirtan, everything, you get many, many spiritual impressions. And they'll always come in your mind. And the mature impressions cannot cover them anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of the developing the samskars, spiritual samskars. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you something. Yes. <coughs> Just before you were talking about uh, there is a, a diamond for bad people like, mm -hmm. in the bodies. Mm -hmm. How can we know? Mm -hmm. How can we make the difference between the good ones and the bad ones? Yes, it's very, it's very difficult to identify who is a genuine person mm -hmm. and who is a a demonic person. Yeah, demonic person. Uh -huh. So, actually, those who are very demonic, they act in a very friendly way. But then they go and they tell someone, they say something about you, to someone else. So they're friendly to you, but they make problems through proxy, through others. Because if they'll make problem directly to you, then they cannot <laughs> control you. You see? So this is their nature. So those persons who go behind your back and make trouble through others, through gossip and everything, then this is some dark, dark quality. If you have some disagreement with someone, go face to face and work it out directly. Don't go through others. It's a very bad quality. What, what do you do to find the strength to, to say exactly what you feel with love? Mm -hmm. how, how do you manage to, to when you're, you have a... A difficult situation with somebody, mm -hmm. and you have to say your truth. That mm -hmm. you're afraid this person will not understand you. Or strength, yes. strength does not come from being strong. Strength comes from realizing that you're not strong. Mm -hmm. Strength comes from humility. So, in, in any, we sometimes are afraid to speak to someone because actually our ego is big. And the big ego is also somewhat fragile mm? and very tender. If someone will poke it, it, it hurts, you see? So become very, very humble. In, when the fisherman cash, throws his net in the ocean, all the big fish get trapped. But the small fish, they swim through. So the problems of, of Maya, Maya is like a net. And it catches the big egos. And those who are very small, they don't get caught in the illusions, in the conflicts. So if also if you are very respectful to someone, even they may from a mature perspective don't deserve any respect. But anyway you respect them. That brings out the best of that person. Huh? Mm -hmm. If we come in a confrontational mm -hmm. mood and thinking I am great and he is useless, 
uh, then a conflict. But if you come thinking, actually, I am a soul and he is also a soul. And we are both useless. <laughs> but, <laughs> I should respect him because Krishna is also in his heart. And you come in and you will see it brings out the best. In fact, Bhakti Yoga has three stages. And the first stage is called the stage of Sadhana. When you are trying to get realization. So in that, that stage, when you practice your sadhana every day, it produces two results. The first result is called Kleshagani, the destruction of suffering in your life. Does anyone know Patanjali? Yoga Sutra is here. So in the beginning of Patanjali, there's a description of Klesh, five types of Klesh, the causes of suffering. So Bhakti Yoga first destroys the Klesh, the causes of suffering in your life. And then the next aspect is called Shubhada. It makes your life auspicious. Auspiciousness <coughs> includes, one, you always feel satisfied. Two, you very easily have good association with sadhus. At first, you may meet your guru, and then you go away and you cannot see him for a whole year. And you have to do so many things. It's very difficult to meet with your guru again. Why? Because it's the beginning stage. As, as you practice your sadhana every day and your sadhana gets strong, you see, you easily meet with your guru. You can live with your guru even. Hmm? I lived with my guru for 15 years. Hmm? He literally told me, I want you to stay by my side 24 hours a day. When I eat, when I sleep, and when I uh, speak, when everywhere, always be with me. And he kept me like this. So there's a stage when you're doing sadhana, when the association of a saint, this becomes very easy in your life. So these are the symptoms of Shubhada, auspiciousness. First, you always feel content and happy. Two, you easily get the association of saints that you need to progress. Three, you feel affection for everyone. Hmm? For everyone you feel affection. Even if someone is a demon, right? then you don't go against them. You cannot interact with them because they'll become offensive. They'll make offenses to Krishna. So you avoid the demons. So you don't put them in a situation where they worsen their own situation. So you avoid the demons out of kindness to them. But you're not against them. You want them to be happy also. So you have affection. And then the next stage is everyone has affection for you. So when you do sadhana nicely, you'll see that the people you meet, they connect with you very easily. And they feel love for you. They feel like they know you, even though they never met you before. Hmm? Even if you're walking in the street and there's a wild dog, rah, even the wild dog will wag his tail and come to you. Like this. And all the living entities will show affection for you. So these are just some of the side effects of having a strong sadhan, hmm? early morning meditation every day. Hmm? Can I? Um, in relation that you say about diamonds and she said we can go deeper because mm. I have the feeling that all we have our dark side inside and it seems that sometimes the spirituality doesn't we see the light but mm. sometimes for me it's important to see my dark side mm. to know how it's uh, managing um, how you you manage your dark, dark side and <laughs> because the uh, light has its other face, no? Yeah. The dark, because day and night yeah. are the same. Yes. So we are talking a lot of diamonds. Everyone. Like, and another question is, yes. there is another thing in this. Um, I have many times in my life that all that we see in another person is a reflection within us. So if I see him as a diamond, maybe there is a reflection of my own diamond. Mm. So this is true. Okay, so there are two questions here. First of all, you said sorry, you said uh, diamond, demon, demon. 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 No, yeah, it's a joke. It's a joke. See. Yeah. Demon. But you those, can see those the diamond. Are, in the, the same, no? <laughs> <laughs> the same. Yes. So, demon, demon. Ah, because we are everyone in the context. You know, <laughs> if you listen, if you listen, not to his words, but the, what he. Yeah, yeah. It's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Don't worry, I got you joking. <laughs> Because so you know that Krishna is also very humorous. Yeah. All, all comedy comes from Krishna, so Krishna is fun, more funny than anyone. I guarantee. When you meet Krishna, you see he's hilarious. <laughs> so, first of all, it is said. There are four yugas, Satya Yuga, Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, Dropa Yuga and Kali Yuga. In Satya Yuga, the demons and the, and the devatas, they're born on different planets. Mm. Then in the Treta Yuga, they're born on the same planet. Then in Dwarpa Yuga, demons and demigods are born in the same family. <laughs> That's why you have in Bhagavad Gita, on one side Arjuna and his brothers and then his half-brothers Duryodhan. They're born, demons and the, and the devotees are born in the same family. And then in Kali Yuga, the demon mm -hmm. and the demigod is born in the same body. Mm -hmm. So we have both sides. We have both sides. But still there are some proportions. So mainly, most people, they have their uh, better nature is predominant. But there are some persons who have fully surrendered to the dark nature. To the dark nature. Now the question comes on us. We have some light and some dark in, inside there. So the principle to overcome this is called anugatya. It means to be under guidance. How my guru is meditating? How my guru is studying? How my guru is serving? I want to follow that. And you try to conform your life to the life of your spiritual teacher. For Christians, they try to conform their life to the life of Christ. Like this. So we have to follow some perfect example. And slowly, 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 the dark side will become eradicated. In Sanskrit, that is called anartha nivriti, the overcoming of the worthless, unwanted uh, mentalities. So they are there, but they'll be cleansed away. And they're more or less almost completely cleansed by the middle stage of bhakti. That stage is called nishta. Nishta means steadiness. When every day you are very steady in your devotional activities, then all of the darkness, not completely, but 99% is gone. And then that last small percent, it cannot affect, it's not enough to affect you. And when you progress further and attain prem, pure love for Krishna, then that dark side is completely gone. Completely gone. And so that is why it is said that the path of spiritual life is devotion to Guru. Because if you always keep your Guru in your mind, and you always try to follow the example of your Guru, then you will not make a wrong step. You will be progressing, progressing, progressing. Hmm? Otherwise, what will you think? You think, how should I do this? How should I do that? And you come under the control of your own material samskars. So people think that they are free if they choose everything themselves. But when you are making all your own choices, now you're actually not free, you're under the bondage of karma. It is the illusion of freedom. But when you surrender fully to the spiritual master, everyone will say he is not free. He became a slave to his guru. <laughs> <laughs> but actually your soul becomes completely free. <laughs> and after some time, after some time, your guru doesn't have to tell you do this, do that. You spontaneously become inspired in the heart by your guru and by Krishna. How, what to do in, in every moment? because you become free from the uh, material illusion. So, if you want to become free, first you have to surrender. Just like if a person is drowning in the ocean, then the lifeguard comes swimming, and that person who is drowning is hysterical. <laughs> ah! Sometimes they hit the lifeguard also. <laughs> so then the lifeguard has to slap their face and boom, and make them calm down and say, relax. And then, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> and then the lifeguard puts their hand under the chin and swims and brings them back to the shore. So when they're in the water, the lifeguard is in charge and controlling. And he'll bring the drowning person to the shore. But when they're on the shore, now they're equal. So Guru is Guru now in this world. But when he takes you to the spiritual world, then you just become friends. Hmm? That relationship is due to the necessity of the moment. Guru never wants to control you. He never wants to be a Guru even. A Guru is only thinking, I am disciple of my Guru. Huh? A Guru even never makes disciples. A guru will not go, uh, do you want to be my disciple? 
Come here, I'll give you initiation. I'll give you mantra. Never. Guru is only serving. He's Guru. And that service to his Guru, uh, that love for his Guru creates a vacuum. And it sucks everyone into it. All the disciples, all the students are coming themselves without the Guru doing anything. Hmm? Because of the devotion, the devotion to his own Guru is drawing everyone. He is following. So everyone wants to follow him. If you don't follow your Guru, no one wants to follow you. If you follow your Guru, every, the whole world will want to be your disciple without you even saying anything. So this is the actual, the parampara, how the parampara works, the, the spiritual dynamic. How do we become a Guru? You don't, you just become a disciple. <laughs> you become a disciple. And automatically people will want to, after some time, become your disciple. Don't be a guru. Don't become a guru. Just become a disciple. Chela. Chela, yeah. Chela is a common language, actually. In Sanskrit, in Sanskrit, disciple is called shishya. Shishya. It comes from a shasdatu. It means discipline. Who is under discipline? Who is not free to do anything? But is under the discipline the, of the instructions of the spiritual master called shishya. So in Bhagavad Gita, in chapter 2, verse 7, See, Arjuna, he says, Karpanya dosha pahata subhava prichchami tam dharma sumudha cheta yatsrayasya nishitam bruitan me shishasteham sadimam tam prapanam. You know, Arjun was a warrior and he had friends on both sides, so he didn't want to fight in the battle. And he became so upset he had a nervous breakdown. So he came to Krishna and was almost like arguing with Krishna. What if I do this? What if I do that? What if I do this? And then finally he realized, actually I have no clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> so then he said to Krishna, Oh Krishna, now I realized that I am simply confused. I don't know what is good for me. I don't know what is bad for me. So you kindly tell me the path. Now, shishasteham. Now I have become your disciple. Shadiman. Give me discipline. Tvam prapanam, I have surrendered to you. After that, then Krishna gives instruction in the Bhagavad Gita. After that, chapter 2, verse 7, he speaks. In, before that, Krishna does not speak any spiritual instruction. Because one who is not surrendered is not a candidate to receive spiritual instruction. If a person is not surrendered, if they think they know, then the instructions will just bounce off. So first we have to follow Arjun. Oh, Gurudev. I, I followed my own mind for a million lifetimes and I'm still here. <laughs> and I'm still suffering and I still don't know anything and I'm confused. So I, you know Vedas and you have received all the uh, secrets of the Vedas because you served your Guru with your whole life. So I am surrendering to you. Please accept me as your disciple. And then one becomes connected through service and gradually there's the transmission of Divya Gyan. That Diksha, initiation. Diksha means, initiation is called in Sanskrit Diksha. So Diksha has two syllables. Diksha. Di means Divya Gyan. Transcendental knowledge is given. And Sha means all your karma and material samskars, material impressions in your mind, they are destroyed. So Diksha, the spiritual knowledge is given and the material contamination is removed. Fly is going here and there, and there's a web of a spider, and they hit the web of the spider, and now they're stuck, and they cannot get out. So, right now in history, there are two things where devotees, they're moving in their life, but then they get stuck, and they cannot get out. One is flat earth debate, and the other one is whether the jiva has a suruk or not. Mm. And these are the two, there are so many devotees right now stuck in one or the other and some are stuck in both at the same time. Mm. And because of this their mind is going round and round and round. They cannot be peaceful and they cannot be absorbed in the sweetness and nectar of Harina. <laughs> and it's being absorbed in their Sambandha, Nitya Sambandha with Radha and Krishna. It's very problematic. A devotee from America just wrote to me yesterday. 
and said there was a in the Badger, you know, there was a Badger Festival, yeah. New Badger in California. Mm -hmm. It was just going on, and one devotee just wrote to me that Chamarani went there, mm -hmm. and she's printed a new book about the, whether the jiva has a swoop or not a swoop, and it made a big fire, oh. Oh. and everyone was burning in that fire for the whole festival mm. this year. So, this is very, very important. Srila Bhakti Nautakur spoke about two types of Vaishnavas, Saragrahi and Barabahi. Bara means a, a weight and Vahi means one who carries. A person carries on their head a heavy weight in the form of theoretical knowledge. Theoretical knowledge. They know so many Jiva Tattva, Nam Tattva, so many Tattvas, all theoretical and they're carrying it. But they don't realize it. Huh? And then the other one is called Saragrahi. Sara means essence and Grahi means one who accepts. What is the essence of spiritual life? That is service to Guru and uh, surrender to Harinam and especially to always chant with the Sambandha, the relationship that Gurudev has given you with Krishna at the time of Gopal Mantra in the in Diksha, second, second initiation. You should be always situated in your Abhiman, your identity, that identity that Guru has given and that everything should proceed from that. So what are the values of your identity? Then you act according to those values. If you're not in that identity, then your actions will proceed from a material identity. So to be Sankirtan means Kirtan with Sambandanya. Kirtan being in fixed in your spiritual identity. Then it's called Sankirtan. And that is the essence. So we want to be Saragrahi and not Barabahi. And the material energy is always turbulent and trying to take us away from the essence to become absor have ab avesh, absorption in something peripheral hmm? on the last moment of your life. Hmm? Whether the jiva swoop or no swoop or whether the world is flat or round, it will not have anything. It will actually just be damaging. Hmm? But in the last moment of your life, you call the name of Krishna with your Sambandha and you become Siddha. Very easily you become a Siddha. There is also many devotees who are stuck and also ladies of course with this whole issue, you know, that about uh, all the Vedas they speak like about women and, and this whole and even mm -hmm. that, oh, what Srila Prabhupada yeah, says, it should be changed. I didn't mention that. I didn't mention, that's, that's another, that's a special one, yes. especially only for Switzerland. Yes. Oh. I mean, oh. I feel so terrible, you know, that it is why this is... But a new one has come up in Switzerland now, Goranga Nagari. Oh, I know. Right? Yes. It's correct. It's one, one new person, she's, she left. Ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Krishna Chandra wrote to me, he said, now the, in Switzerland, the Goranga Nagari, People made a face, Goranga Nagari Facebook page and they have 5,000 followers. My God. Mm -hmm. So it's becoming, Switzerland is becoming Goranga Nagari. So, <laughs> and some I'm of not. Germany also. Mm -hmm. German speaking mm -hmm. devotees. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I'm not living there. So you see, actually, spiritual life is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Very dangerous. Yeah. If you're independent, if you're not under yeah. guidance, yeah. you yeah. will uh, crash down. You will be caught, you will be captured. Captured by Maya one way or another. For sure. So, on the one hand, it is important that we have the right conception, and you are, you have been one of those who have been defending the proper Siddhanta yes. coming in our parampara. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you say it's a danger that we get stuck in this kind of arguments or what is exactly yeah, the because, point like because some some discussions mm. are relevant to our sadhana and some are not mm. let me tell you one story there was a devotee named uh, Dravida he's one of the ISKCON scholars from ISKCON and he wanted to know about the fifth canto mm -hmm. so he came many years ago to Devananda Gaudiamat when my good days was somewhat younger and leading the parakras so thousands of people were there and he, he came with Pushpadant it was Pushpadant and Dravida two disciples of Srila Prabhupada. So they came to Devan under Gaudimata and they're looking around. Oh, where is Srila Narayana? So they came to our Gurudev and they said, Oh, um, we have the fifth canto here. We want to ask you a question about all the planets and everything. Gurudev said, 
If you want to know about the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu <laughs> and Ujwal Nilamani, you can ask me. Otherwise, go to Srila Vama Maharaj. And he just sent me. So it was good days, Bhav. These things, either you realize or you don't realize. And if you do realize or you don't realize, it doesn't matter. Because it's not relevant to your sadhya and your sadhana. <laughs> anyway. Then some will say, why is it there in the Bhagavatam? Uh, it's one of the um, ten symptoms of a Mahapurana. Atrasaga visagasya sthanam poshum utaya mandanta ishanukata nirodha mukti asraya. So something about the structure of the universe is one of the symptoms of a Mahapurana to give us some perspective. It's not to teach us geography. It's to teach us that there are different levels of existence and humans are about in the middle and there are those who are below us and there, there are those who are above us and then there's a world also beyond all of those levels as well. It's to orientate us in relation to reality so we can see where we are in relation to bhakti. It's not a geography lesson so you can whatever go on a journey and go to that place. Yeah, but my question was actually like in especially topics like the Swarup or other um, more related. It may not be so relevant, you said, because if you're not on that level, then what does it matter? Mm. But I think Shamarani, she had the intention to clear doubts. But then, yes, yes, but it created more doubts. You see, the thing is, both perspectives are correct. Yeah. But you cannot learn that from a book. You have to sit down with the Diksha Guru or Shiksha Guru and hear the explanation. And then, it, because it's beyond the, it is a chincha subject. Yes. It's beyond the mind. So I, I told her, I said, because she gave me the script and asked me to go over it. Mm -hmm. So I found some mistakes in the translations of verses from the Sandarvas. Mm -hmm. So I translated some Sanskrit verses from the uh, Sandarvas that were in the book. She said, so I have to put your name in the book because you translated. I said, no, don't put my name there. Because in my heart, I'm not in agreement with this book. Mm -hmm. Because I said, instead of solving the problems, it will ignite another round of fire. And I just got, I said this about three months ago. And just yesterday, I got the message from America. Oh, there's been a fire. And I, I'm like, a, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. I knew exactly what would happen then. I predict, I can show in writing where I said this. Even. So, um, it, this is, some of these things, they can only be solved in a personal interaction. They cannot be solved just by thinking about yeah, it. I heard, I heard the conversations you had on the subject, and I, to some extent, I can understand how it's a chintya. It's yes. not one or the other. They're different perspectives. One perspective is within material time, yeah. prakrit kal, yeah. and one is the aprakrit kal from outside of material time. So, but it doesn't matter whichever perspective you have. But it will not stop your progress in spiritual life. Because your sadhana is the same, your goal is the same. And I'll give a praman from Bhagavad Gita. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said, Mahatmanas tu mam parta daivim prakashim asrita bhajante nanya manaso gyata bhutadim avyayam. He said, the great souls, they're under the control of the spiritual energy. And gyatva bhutadim avyayam. Those who know that I am Krishna's, those who know that I am the inexhaustible, unlimited, supreme truth, they serve me with one pointed attention. Hmm? So, in the commentary on this, Srila Vishnu Chakritakur said, There's two types of knowledge Tatpadata Gyan, knowledge of God, and Twampadata Gyan, the knowledge of yourself, hmm? about the Swarup of the Jiva. And in this verse, Krishna said, Those who know that I am the source of everything and serve me, they become perfect. So Vishnu Chakritakur said, he never said those who also know the tattva of themselves. So um, in the commentary, Vishnu Chakritakur is saying that the perfection of your bhajan does not depend on tatpadata gyan, <coughs> understanding your own Jeev Swarup tattva. Yeah. If you're dedicated to Krishna, all perfection comes, whether you understand yourself or not. <coughs> because realization of yourself will be included in realization of Krishna. Hmm? When the sun goes down and it's dark, you can't see yourself. But when the sun rises, you see the sun and you also see yourself without making a, a, an extra effort. So the, the Swarup Gyan is not essential to become perfect in Bhakti.
And that's why I didn't want to become involved in that in that controversy because it's not. But if you have this idea or that idea, both will work. It's okay. They're provisional. It's many of the sedances are provisional sedan. It's just an idea until you realize the truth. It's just to make you look in the right direction. Because words are also limited. Words are limited. Yes. Okay, one very small last one. If uh, I w- I'm curious, uh, since many years, how was the uh, moment when Arjuna he get this shift to understand actually need to surrender to Krishna? What was in the heart that make him understand? Uh, because before he posed so many options, no, that he mm-hmm. can do, and then in the end, how was the shift? Because of when he saw the spiritual, the universal form was very much later. And, uh, you see, Arjuna is a pure devotee. He's enlightened. He knows everything. But Krishna just covered his knowledge to do this drama so they could have a conversation that we come back with Gita to teach us. You see? So Krishna, by his yoga maya, confused him. And then gradually withdrew this. So as Krishna was withdrew, then gradually Arjuna was getting some wisdom. Some wisdom was coming back to him. So it's not that Krishna was giving him wisdom. Arjuna has wisdom. Krishna covered it and he was just slowly uncovering okay. <laughs> like that. So his natural personality would come. So he was arguing almost right up to that point when he said, oh, actually I'm confused. But right up to there. And also, um, Krishna is, did it in such a way that he wasn't fully clear. Even when he, he said, I surrender, but he didn't fully surrender at that point. Hmm. So that's because a disciple is like, when a disciple comes, he said, good, I I surrender, but actually he doesn't. <laughs> he's just saying it. <laughs> huh? Because he's too impure. He's, it's good, I I want to surrender, mm. or I'll, I'll surrender a little bit, <laughs> uh, but not actually. The, the disciples are, good, I am surrendering to you. <laughs> <laughs> and Guru is like, ah. <laughs> Nice we'll idea. See. We'll see. Okay, in principle, it's a good idea. But Gurudev is very kind and gives encouragement. And slowly, slowly, the surrender is something that grows over time. When the relationship and the faith become stronger and stronger. Uh, like this. So that's what happened. Because first Arjuna said, okay, I dropped my bow, I'm not going to fight. And then he said to Krishna, I surrender to you. Then after he said, I surrender, then again he said, I am not going to fight. <laughs> Which means he was still holding on to his own idea or something. Mm? He wasn't fully surrendered. But in the end of Bhagavad Gita, then Krishna asked him, Oh, did you realize the truth? He said, Yes, Krishna, now I realize everything. And then he followed Krishna. So by the end, he surrendered fully. But even in the beginning, when he surrendered, it was something from the mouth and something from the heart, but not fully. Bhagavad Gita is perfect. It is to show us practically what we have to go through. Mm. Huh? 